My theme today is, yes, you can choose a happier life. And yes, you can choose to be happier. Yes, you can choose to be healthier. And yes, you can, if you want, choose to be wealthier. I'll touch on each of these as I go along. But before that, there's one idea that I would like you to get really clear in your mind. And it's very important to understand this one principle that's been around for thousands of years. And that is that thoughts are things. Okay, every thought that you think, every word that you speak, every picture that you imagine in your mind produces a result. And the problem, one of the problems that people have is that they are thinking and talking and focusing on things that they don't want in their lives. You hear people talking about, I don't want to be sick, I don't want to be overweight, I don't want a car breaking down, I don't want this miserable relationship, I don't want to be broke, I don't want all these bills. We spend all our time talking about what we don't want. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you focus on, you get. When I was writing Handbook to a Happier Life, I went looking for some of that information. Marcus Aurelius in the second century said, our life is what our thoughts make of it. Nothing new here, folks. Emerson in the 1800s said, a man is literally what he thinks. Earl Nightingale said, we move in the direction of our currently dominant thoughts. And I'm going to say that what you focus on is what shows up in your life. What you focus your mind on is what you see showing up. I'm going to prove that. We're going to do a little exercise. I'd like you to just look around the room for a moment and make a note of everything that you see in this room that's green. Okay, let's find all the green. Like we have kind of the green wall. We got some green, what is this, spinach or kale or something over here, some green leafy thing. Uh, got some more green over there. Woman with a green sweater. Look around, there's a lot of green in the room, okay? Now I'd like you to close your eyes and recall everything that you saw that was blue. What happened? You can get it. The blue is here. Look around. He's got a blue hat. There's a blue jacket there. There's blue in the flag. There's blue all over the place. But we didn't see it because you were focusing on green. It's the same thing. It's like when you buy a red car, all of a sudden you start seeing red cars. They're always there. We have filters in our brain that keep that from coming in or else we'd be overwhelmed with everything that's out there coming at us. Does everyone have a handout? This is something that you can take home. I'm going to kind of walk through it as we go. Uh, I don't expect you to do any of this now, but it just gives you something to think about and some tools that you can use to create the life that you want. You know, if you want to know more about how thoughts affect your mind, there's the work of Dr. Wayne Dyer on Power of Intention, Masaru Emoto on Messages of Water, uh, Dr. Dave Hawkins in Power Versus Field. These people are all neuroscientists are now going into the effect of vibration and frequencies and thoughts and how all this stuff links together because we have the technology to do it. And it's fascinating because it's really, it's a very simple thing. You want to think about what you want. If you want to be healthy, think about health, talk about health, affirm health, see yourself healthy. Don't go to the opposite. A mind does not work on the opposite. If I say to you, don't think of a pink elephant, what happens? You go right to the pink elephant. The mind does not know the opposite of an idea. And you hand out, there's a wonderful quotation that fits right into that from Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was in a concentration camp at Auschwitz and wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning about how he got through all of that. And this is kind of the crux of what he said, is that the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. You can choose what goes on in here, in your head. That's about the only thing we really have control over. And sometimes these decisions are thrown at us. Sometimes we have to make choices that can be life-altering, and maybe we weren't ready for it, maybe we didn't plan on it. I had that happen to me a number of years ago. At the time, my life was pretty much at the bottom. My, my lifestyle and my excesses brought me down. I was living in a, a single-room occupancy in the South Bronx, not a place you want to live. You know, it's one of these places when you go in the bathroom, you turn the light on, the cockroaches would look back at you and go, yo, turn the light off, you're bothering me. And uh, it was very strange. It was really down. I was barely getting by. And I woke up one morning. My head was throbbing because I had been partying too much the night before. That had pretty much become my life. And I opened one eye and I looked out and I saw one of those smiley faces. You know, the little round yellow things, the dopey little smiley faces? I said, wow, that's weird. And then I noticed it was moving. I said, okay. So I opened my other eye, 
And I saw that it was on a slipper that was attached to the end of my foot. I kind of looked around the room, you know, not quite sure what was going on, coming out of the fog. Anybody who's been there knows what I'm talking about. And you could see the industrial green paint peeling off the walls and the bare neon lights coming down. It took me about a minute, but I figured out I was not in the Four Seasons. And where I was was the detox water Bailey Seton Hospital in Staten Island because my, wife, my life had gone all the way to the bottom and I basically crashed and burned. And I was faced with the choice that I want to continue this and maybe die or worse yet live, or was I willing to shut my mouth and open my ears and listen to people and take some suggestions and reach out and get the help that's there. And anybody who needs help who's sitting here today who needs help with any kind of addiction, whether it's alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, debt, shopping, whatever, the help's there. All you have to do is reach out and say, I need help, and it shows up. We've got more resources in our society, more self-help groups. There are tons of resource people here today for every imaginable problem. But they're not dominoes. They don't deliver. You have to go out and say, hey, I need your help. Can you help me? And I did that, and my life started changing. And little by little, I put it back together, and it's kind of where I got to today. So it's really, what are, you, what are your choices? What do you want in your life? What do you want your life to be? What do you want your life to become? You know, you've got to dream again. That's a, it's a strange thing that as we become adults, we forget how to dream. We all knew how to do that when we were kids. Anybody here with young children, if you say to them, what do you want for Christmas? They don't say, oh, I don't know. You know, they go, here. They hand you a list. They say, by the way, I put some web links on it, so you make it easier for you to get to it. You know, kids have no problem dreaming. They know what they want. My favorite dream story of all time was opening day of Disney World in Florida. And the reporters were there, and they were talking to Roy Disney, Walt's brother. And the reporter said, this is amazing. This is an awesome place. This is absolutely fantastic. It's clean. It's safe. It's fascinating. Families are going to come here for years to come, and they're going to totally enjoy it. This is really wonderful. He said, you know, the only sad thing is that your brother, Walt, did not live to see this. And without missing a beat, Roy Disney looked at the reporter, and he said, excuse me, Walt saw it first. That's why you're seeing it today. Disney was a dreamer. Martin Luther King was a dreamer. Kennedy was a dreamer. <clears throat> Anita Roddick, a woman in England, decided that she wanted to make good skincare products and help third world countries in the environment and created a little business called The Body Shop. And it went from a little store to being in every mall in the world. Jim Carrey, the actor, was a dreamer. Carrey couldn't get arrested as an actor. He was totally unemployed, walking around trying to make enough money to feed himself. And he had a check in his wallet. He wrote on the check, Pay to the order of James Carey $7 million for professional services. And he folded it up and put it in his wallet. And I don't think it's a coincidence that one of his first movies, he was paid $7 million for the part. He knew it. He was a dreamer. He held hard to the vision. And there's a, there's a section in your handout that says in your journal, write 101 dreams. This is an exercise that I learned from Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. Think about what you want to do, what you want to be, what you want to have, what you want to share, and see if you can get to 101. I challenge you to do this. It's quite an exercise. I've done it. Right now I'm back. I'm doing it again. I'm back to about 80, 85. You know, the first 10 or 20 are pretty simple. It's like when people win the lottery. They say, well, what are you going to do now that you won $320 million? And the people say, well, I'm going to pay off my bills. That's cool. Now you have $319,960,000 left. What are you going to do? You know, if you don't have any idea what to do with it, what are you going to do when it shows up? If you want to have a million dollars, start thinking about ways you could use it. What would you do with it? But you want to identify the things you want to do. I did this a few years ago. My wife and I started something we call a looking forward to list. We basically just write down things we want to do. I want to see this movie or that movie, go here, go there. It's totally amazing how many more things we have done since we just started writing down what we'd want to do. So now we don't sit around the house on a Saturday going, well, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know, Marty, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know, let's, uh, let's hang out some more. You know, if you have an idea, we did last week, we went to Longwood Gardens, which is a great place if you've never been there in the Brandywine Valley. It was a nice sunny day, what do you want to do? I don't know, let's look in the book. Oh, Longwood Gardens, let's go down there. It just gives you some references. It helps you to focus your mind. You know, whatever you want will show up. Whatever you put your attention on will show up in your life. So here's the big question, after you do the 101, or 20, or whatever you want to do, the aha question is, what's stopping you from having it right now? Ooh. 
There's only one thing standing in your way. There's only one thing have, stopping anyone here from having everything they absolutely want to have. Want to know what it is? I'm not telling you. You've got to buy the book. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's your beliefs. That's all it is. It's your beliefs about whether or not you can do something. That's all. It's, it's not real. It's a belief. Beliefs are not real. Don't confuse beliefs with reality. You know, I can do a mixed audience. I can say how many people think women are good drivers and some, all the women raise their hands and a couple of brave men. And then how many people think women are lousy drivers and maybe one brave guy in the back will sneak his hand up and nobody's looking. Here there's too many women. It's a rigged audience. How many people here think women are good drivers? Right, everybody's hand goes up. Anybody think women are bad drivers? Got any courageous? Whoops, that went up and down really quick. The reality is I can statistically prove both sides of that. There, you can go out there right now and find women that are driving brilliantly. And you can go out there right now and you can find somebody with a bagel in one hand and a cell phone in the other hand driving a 40-foot SUV at 80 miles an hour in the right-hand lane. Know, whatever you're looking for, you're going to find. So your beliefs are just that. They're just going to they're get in your way because somebody told you something in the third grade and you keep it and you, you carry it around for the rest of your life. And I was told I can't sing. I don't sing. Because I believed it when it was told to me. I was told I can't draw. Fortunately, nobody told me I can't write, so I just go ahead and write. And it's the bumblebee. The bumblebee can't fly. Aerodynamically, the bumblebee cannot fly. It's impossible. Its body is too big. Its wings are too small. Yet the bumblebee goes out there zipping around. You know why? He can't read either. Okay? He doesn't know he can't fly. Nobody told him. I had that demonstrated to me a number of years ago. I was working in broadcast television for the company that is now Madison Square Garden Productions. And I went to work one night, we were doing a New York Knicks game, and I saw a lot of trucks parked out on 33rd Street outside the garden. And I went in and I grabbed somebody and said, what's going on? There's trucks all over the place out here. And they said, oh, the circus is moving into town. I said, wow, the circus, this is cool. Because here I am, an employee in the place, I can go wherever I want, so I'm going to go backstage at the circus. How many times do you have a chance to do that? It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. <coughs> So on my dinner break, I took a walk up to the fifth level in the rotunda behind the garden floor, and I started walking around. I saw the tigers and the lions and the zebras and the giraffes. I remember the giraffe because they had removed the ceiling tiles to make room for him, and he was eating the fiberglass. And a trainer came by, dressed like fiberglass, I guess. The trainer came by and yelled at him in German. It was it coincidentally the father of the guy who's now the trainer with the Ringling Brothers Circus? And the guy, the giraffe stopped, and the guy walked away, and the giraffe went like this. And he watched him. And went right back to eating the ceiling tiles again, right? And I'm walking along, and this was really a cool thing. I remember this like it was yesterday. And I come across a line of elephants of every imaginable size. There are little baby elephants, middle-sized elephants, and the gigunda elephants that weigh about over 3,000 pounds. <clears throat> I'm walking along, and I notice that all these elephants are being held in place with a little rope tied to a stake that's in the ground. <clears throat> two problems with that. Number one, the rope is way too small to hold an elephant. And number two, the stake's not going anywhere because this is on the fifth floor of Madison Square Garden. There's no dirt. The only dirt there is what they put down. Under the two inches of dirt is concrete. The stake's not going into concrete. But the elephants are standing there. I don't understand why this elephant doesn't leave. So I walk over to the trainer and I said, tell me something, why doesn't the elephant just break the rope Go down the ramp, go up 8th Avenue, go back out the Lincoln Tunnel to wherever he came from. And what the trainer told me, now I am not endorsing this in any way, I'm an animal activist. But here's what happens, they take the elephant when it's a baby and they tie it up with a rope. And the baby elephant is not strong enough to break the rope. The baby elephant pulls on a rope and it doesn't break. And the little elephant pulls the rope again and it still doesn't break. And the little elephant pulls the rope a third time and it doesn't break, so finally he gives up. It's what's called learned helplessness. And the baby elephant grows up conditioned to stand there, even though this rope cannot hold him as an adult. Baby elephant grows up believing there's nothing he can do. So my question to all of you here this morning is what ropes are holding you? What are your ropes? What are you not doing because you have an old belief that may no longer be true, maybe it was never true. 
and it's stopping you from being the person that you know you're capable of becoming. And I challenge you to challenge that belief and to do something to change it. And there's a lot of different ways in a lot of different people's books, including mine. And I don't have time to really go into that, but one simple way that works really well is you create a vision of something beyond. Get a mental picture of what you want in your life. And Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Use your imagination. Get a clear picture of what you want your life to be like. And then watch it show up. Back at the end of World War II, there was a young kid in Austria who was about 14 years old. And he was a straggly, skinny little guy. His father used to really pick on him a lot because he, his father was a tyrant. He was an ex-Nazi officer. And an ex-Nazi officer at the end of World War II had to be a pretty depressing job to be in. And he would just kind of beat up on his son a lot. So his son started lifting weights. And he had seen a movie. He saw the movie Hercules with Steve Reeves. Somehow he linked it. I don't know how he did this one, but he linked up in his brain that the way out of this situation, because Austria wasn't the place he wanted to be in that time, was to become a bodybuilder, win the Mr. Universe contest, and get a job in the movies in Hollywood. Now, how he got from there to there, I don't quite understand. That's kind of a weird pathway, but he did. So he created a vision, and every night, and this is in his words, every night when he went to bed, he would picture himself standing on a podium with a medal draped around his neck with people applauding. During the day, he'd be lifting the weights, and at night, he would stand there, he would lay there, and he would see himself standing with the medal and the applause. Seven years later, Arnold Schwarzenegger became the youngest man to win the Mr. Universe contest. The interesting aside is that his first movie, remember, he saw Steve Reeves in Hercules. Arnold's first movie was Hercules Comes to New York. Terrible movie, but it got him to Hollywood. And today he's governor of California. That's the power of visualization. That's the power of using your mind. We know from neuropsychology today that your conscious mind, this part of us that walks around going, hiya, Harry, hiya, hiya, what's going on? That is one-sixth of our mental capacity. 17%, less than 17% of our mental capacity is our conscious mind. The other 83% is below the surface. That's the subconscious, the unconscious, that you say, okay, I have a picture of myself speaking to people, sharing things that have helped me to help other people. I used to do that on a treadmill. I wasn't speaking, 1987, 88, I was not doing this. I was on a treadmill, and to keep myself from getting bored, I would create pictures of doing this, and here I am alone, standing here. Get it in your mind, get the picture going, write it out, write out a vision statement about what you want. You can do that. I was working with a couple of women who are probably the top coaches in the world, Sharon Wilson and Terry Levine, and we were using some of these tools, and one of the things we were doing was picking something in our business, it was a business group, and picking something and writing down the vision as though it had already occurred. So I decided to take my book. At the time, Handbook to a Happier Life, hold up the book, Jim, there we are. Handbook to a Happier Life was published by me. It was a little, much smaller, much plainer looking. And I decided that to get to my next level, I had to get a bigger publisher. So I wrote a little one page, it wasn't even a page, as though it had already happened. I had things like, oh, this is great, I have a big publisher, and they're wonderful, and they're, they're doing all this, and they did a nice cover design on a book, and it's a wonderful book, they did a beautiful job, and it's in the bookstores, and they're doing a publicity, and this is so much fun. None of that was true at the time. But I would read that vision, and I would get into that energy of it already having accomplished it. And then I would say, okay, so now what? Because you have to take the action. You can't just sit around visualizing your life. People try that. They sit there and they meditate and they visualize. And nothing happens. The Bible says faith without works is dead. The other side of that are people that take a lot, a lot of action. You see this in companies all the time. It's insane. They have salespeople making 100 phone calls an hour. What are you, crazy? There are better ways. I teach better ways. If anybody has a company like that, they can hire me. I'll come in. I'll show them another way. The way to do it, I have a, a friend who's a great healer, and she put, it, she put it really well. She said, I go up and then I go out. Go to spirit, go to higher levels. In your mind, create the picture of what you want, then take the action. And if you do it in that sequence, you get a different result. 
I did this. I had anybody here who's ever thought about writing a book? Do we have anybody writing a book here? Yeah, everybody will tell you. You've written one? Or are you writing? No, I just thought about it. Thought about it. Okay, that's, that's where you start. Everybody will tell you that you have to write a proposal and query letters and send it out to hundreds of publishers and it's impossible. And Chicken Soup for the Soul was turned down by 144 publishers. They reinvented the book business. I sent out three faxes. So after doing my little visual alignment tool, my visualization, and getting my energy aligned, I said, okay, what can I do that would move me in this direction? And I got an inspired idea. I call it inspired action as opposed to gerbil action. Gerbil action is where you just do a lot of stuff and nothing happens. I said, well, you know, I've sold a bunch of these books, so why don't I write this letter that says, hey, I've sold a bunch of books, and maybe you could too, why don't you buy my book? Something to that effect. And I went looking for publishers, and I sent one to Simon & Schuster, who I don't think even answered it. I sent one to someone else I don't remember. And I sent one to New World Library, because they're one of the most prestigious publishers in the personal growth world. They started with uh, creative visualization by Sharthi Gwey, and now they have Power of Now with Eckhart Tolle, they have My Handbook to a Happier Life, they have uh, Gene Slater's Hiring the Heavens, really classy people. So I sent the facts to them. I figured, okay, those are my three targets. I only have time to do three of these. I went on their website and I went digging to see who to send it to, and up pops the name of a woman who five years prior to that wanted to buy this book when she was at another publishing company. And now she's at New World, and she's the acquisitions editor. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe that just happened. You get clear about what you want. Goethe wrote it. He said, you, once one is committed, providence moves too. You get your commitment. Let the world respond to that, and things will show up. That's why Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't see it happening, it's not going to happen. Well, you can have no knowledge, start with the picture, the knowledge or the people with the knowledge will show up in your life. I've had that happen to me. So you start there, using your imagination, use the power of your mind. Let's try something now. This will be fun. I'm going to ask you to just relax if you're writing or anything to stop and just take a breath and we're in a safe environment. Maybe you could just close your eyes for a moment. <clears throat> okay, I'd like you to imagine that you're home in your kitchen and on the counter in front of you is a cutting board and a knife and a really nice big yellow lemon. You see the lemon sitting there. And in your mind, I'd like you to pick up the knife and slice the lemon in half. And maybe pick up one half of the lemon and just kind of look at it and notice that fresh, yellow, crisp, clear. Maybe you want to smell it, that this clean lemon smell. It's a really nice smell of fresh lemon. And in your mind, Take that half a lemon, bring it up to your mouth, and bite into it as hard as you can. Really bite down on a lemon. Okay, open your eyes, thank you. How many people had a reaction? These people are sitting here going, ah, okay. Okay, now here's the second part of that question. Where is the lemon? I don't have a lemon, you don't have a lemon here? You created a physical response in your body with the power of your thought. You visualized your body to produce digestive enzymes is what actually took place. Just using your mind. That's a cool Paula trick, but imagine what else you could do with that same gigantic power that sits between our ears and people brag about only using 10% of. I only use 10% of my brain. I wouldn't go bragging about that personally. You know. It's kind of weird. So what do you want? This is a health summit. So what do you want for your health? <clears throat> what do you want your health to be? You want to be in better shape physically? You want to lose weight? You want to get healthier? You want to start exercising? You know, write this, some of this stuff down. Get, start using a journal. If you don't have a journal, I would really suggest you get some kind of a notebook, something to start recording what you want in your life. Because it's far too important to just let it slip by. You know, if you don't decide what you want, things will just happen. You'll just be a victim of circumstance. Or you can control it. You can take charge of your destiny and create the life that you were born to live. What are your, what are your health choices? What are some things that you could do immediately? One thing I will suggest, because there's a lot of women here. It's a women's summit. Women get ridiculous messages from the media. My wife works with the over 40 woman, does fashion styling, wardrobe and consulting. The average model 
is a size zero or one. The average American woman is a 14. Right away, we got a problem here. So you have to get a sense of who you are. What is your body type? You know, Queen Latifah is not ever going to look like Sarah Jessica Parker. I don't give you a slice her bones in half, man. Right? It's just not going to happen. Oprah's not going to look like Sarah Jessica Parker. Oprah knows that, fortunately. So does Queen Latifah. You know, you, you get a sense of for your body, for who you are, what would be the best you that you can be. You're not going to be perfect. None of us need to be perfect. We need to be a perfect us. I can be a perfect me. I can't be someone else. Make choices and then take some action. Again, get a picture of what you want. Get a photo of yourself at the weight that you felt the best at and put it where you can see it. Zig Ziglar tells a story about when he was 220 pounds, he got a picture of underwear ads and put his, his face on the ad. And he said, you know, they don't use fat boys in underwear ads. I have leverage. The other thing is you want to get some leverage. I have a great leverage story. I'll tell real quick here in 30 seconds or so. I was doing a talk one night in a library and a friend of mine showed up with a video camera and he was sitting on the side, which is not the best angle to tape someone. And the library had the fluorescent lights they have in library conference rooms. That's not the best lighting. And I was wearing, I was, I was about 15 pounds heavier than I am now, which is already more than I want to be. And I was wearing a double-breasted jacket. Any of you guys here, if women have husbands or significant others who are a little overweight, don't let them wear double-breasted jackets. And I always wear my jackets open, and I move around a lot. So after the thing, I'm looking at the video when I get home, and here we go. <laughs> Shamu, right here, folks. It's my Shamu video, and I will keep that video forever. Because any time I start getting over threshold on weight, I just pull that tape out and look at it like, oh my god, I can't go back there again. You, know, you need some kind of a leverage, because it's very easy. I, I was down, I'm 20 pounds above where I was three years ago. I went to Weight Watchers, I dropped a bunch of weight, I was great, lean and mean, get out of my way. And over a period of years, little spoonful by spoonful, I have this thing for Ben and Jerry's. Started creeping back on. It's a whole lot easier to put it on than it is to take it off. Maybe we just need to think like the Hawaiians, just change our references. You want to get some leverage on yourself and take some action. Make some new choices. Make choices here today. Let this be the turning point. You know, when my life changed, when I was at absolute bottom, it changed in an instant. I decided I'm not doing this anymore. I've got to change. And I did. It took a lot to get me to that point. I had to lose everything several times for a period of years. But once I made the choice, the choice was there. And the other thing that you can do is you can make choices about money. And there's a subject nobody wants to talk about in our society. Ooh, money. Ooh. I wrote an article recently in my newsletter about a story from the last gas shortage. Back in the last gas crisis, I had a business in Boston with a man named Irving Goldmarker, who was a story in himself. Interesting man, came from Siberia. And he went out and he traded in his beat-up Pontiac and he bought a brand new Cadillac. He pulls in the office one day and I went over and I said, are you crazy? <laughs> you, know, you just bought a car that gets nine miles to the gallon in the middle of the biggest gas crisis anybody's ever seen. And Irving, in all of his gentle wisdom, said, James, if the price of gas goes up, I will figure out how to make more money. That's a really cool metaphor. I'm not going to be held hostage by the price of gas or the price of ice cream or the price of milk or the price of anything else. And that's not something I have time to go into. I have a program for it. Let me plug the program. It's on my website, Making Friends With Your Money. There are hundreds, if not thousands of ways somebody could increase their income immediately. I know people, there's a seven, I know a 17 year old kid in, in Singapore who made $75,000 in 60 days publishing an ebook that he didn't even write. He got other people to write it and then help him promote it. And he pocketed 75 grand in 60 days at 17 years old. So, I mean, there's no excuses. There's so many opportunities. All you have to do, again, is just say, it would be cool to have an extra couple hundred bucks a month, a couple of thousand bucks a month, whatever. One of my favorite money exercises is close your eyes and get a sense of how much money would make you really feel wow, and then put a zero on it, see what that does to you. That'll, that'll rattle, you, rattle your comfort zone a little bit. Real quick exercise, I'd like you to just close your eyes for a second and imagine it's many years from now and you're near the end of your life. 
Uh, depending on your age, that may be in 10 years, 20 years, 150 years. Maybe you're about 100 years old, and you're sitting there in your rocking chair, and you're looking back, all the way back to this day, October 22nd, 2005, where you decided to make changes. You decided to do some things with your life that would make a difference. And now looking back over that, see that you did all of those things and sit there at the end feeling how great it is that you had this incredible life, that you did all of these things, that you literally sucked the juice out of life. And what a wow that is. Get a sense of how that feels. Okay, you can open your eyes, thank you. I'd like you to finish up with me here. We'll do this together, I'll say it, and then I'd like you to repeat it. I'm gonna go back over the three things I started with. Yes, I can choose to be happier. Yes, yes I can choose to be happier. Yes, I can choose to be healthier. Yes, I can choose to be healthier. And yes, I can choose to be wealthier. Yes, I can choose to be wealthier. Thank you for being here this morning. Make this day special, make it important. Thank you for having me here. God bless you all. Have a wonderful, magical day. Thank you.